Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's new capital webinar, Mid-Year Review and Factor Evaluations. This is Catherine Barr. I'm the Director of Communications at New Capital and I will be the host of today's webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can click the chat function in the menu on your screen um, and we will answer the questions in a Q&A session uh, once at the, at the end of the presentation. So before we get started, I have to offer the following regulatory disclosures. This new capital presentation is being made available for educational purposes only and should not be used for any other purpose. The information presented does not constitute and should not be construed as an offering of advisory services or an offer to sell or solicitation to buy any securities, related financial instruments, financial services, or other services in any jurisdiction. Past investment performance is not an indication of future results. Wherever there is the potential for profit, there is also the possibility of loss. Certain information contained herein concerning economic trends and performance is based on or derived from information provided by independent third-party sources. New Capital believes that these sources from which such information have been obtained are reliable. However, we cannot guarantee the accuracy of such information and have not independently audited these sources. Okay, thank you, and now I'm going to pass it over to Leonard. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having a good summer and enjoying the uh, cool weather here in Houston on this uh, July the 11th. I think we're slated to hit 100 today, but uh, apparently there's a uh, tropical storm coming in, so hopefully it's gonna cool off and um, I'm excited. Our family's going to go next week. We're going to leave for uh, New England. We're going to spend uh, about three weeks. Kids are going to do a reading camp at the college I went to, which is exciting. And we're going to go to Maine and Nova Scotia also. So those are our summer plans. And feel free to type in on your chat what your summer plans are. We'd love to know and, and see what everybody's up to. This is the uh, quarterly market review. I posted your quarterly reports just this morning to Morningstar. Um, you may wonder why does it take a week or so? And, and the answer is we go through every single client's reports and make sure that, uh, that the numbers look right and the tabulations and the calculations. We'd rather be a little late but accurate than obviously earlier and inaccurate. But this uh, presentation we include with your quarterly uh, your quarterly reports. So let's get to it. This was quarter two. Wow, <laughs> you can see off the bat that it was a, a positive quarter across the board for, um, for every asset class that we're looking at here. The US stock market up 4% uh, led the way among all assets, but international developed stocks, not far behind, 3.79, uh, 21 basis point difference. So very close performance between the developed economies of the world, but look at emerging market stocks. Uh, they were positive, 61 basis points up, but not nearly keeping up with the developed economies. Uh, and um, that may be because we're starting to see some, I don't know, some issues with uh, the trade war in China, Brazil, that are having some effect, uh, slowing the growth in those countries. Global real estate, 1.29. And then look at the bond market, everybody. This is really a surprising result that uh, the consensus among professionals if not among everybody, at the start of 2019 is that we would see an ongoing increase in interest rates. And look what has happened. Interest rates, because they went down, sent the value of the bonds up. And the return of 3% for U.S. bonds and global bonds also, 2.75%. This is not far off, is it, from the 4% 0.1% return in the stock market for U.S. stocks and the 3.79% return in international developed stocks. So this is a really strong performance by bonds. 
So your portfolios in quarter two, uh, and I think if you look at your quarterly reports, you will see very, very strong performance uh, across all the asset classes. Okay, let's see, I gotta clear my drawings and turn the page here. All right, so this is, this is taking a look, whoop, excuse me, this is taking a look at longer term returns. Uh, one year, one year returns, five year and 10 year returns. And um, as we can see, the US stock market has been a standout performer over the one, five and 10 year periods. Look at uh, the US versus international developed stocks over the one year period, enormous outperformance. 7%, look at the performance over five years, 8% outperformance every single year. Over the 10 year period, again, 8%. This is really, really strong outperformance and it flows through to emerging markets. And so the question that would be an entirely reasonable question for everybody to ask is, why are we continuing to invest in international investments? So Todd's gonna take that question on Right, because that is a question that we get regularly. Uh, the US bond market, right? Look at the US bond mar market over the last year versus international stocks. 7.87% return to US bonds and 7.61% returns to non US bonds. So bonds have really outperformed international stocks. You know, so we want to talk a little bit today about international stocks. Todd's going to do some discussion uh, of that. Over the 10-year period, things, things tighten up, you know, a little bit more. Uh, bonds, 3.9, 4.44. Look, international bonds have outperformed U.S. bonds over this period. But this chart really begs the question, why invest in international stocks? And we're going to do some talking about that today. Okay, I'm gonna move along to the next slide. Uh, these are headlines, I don't know, let's, let's headlines that have occurred uh, from the second quarter, just to sort of remind everybody, S&P post best first half in 22 years. I want everybody to think back to the end of 2018. Does everybody remember what was going on around Christmas time and how stocks had performed from October and November and into December? I mean, it was, it was uh, I don't know, 15% or so, right, Todd? Turned almost 20% sell-off. And we started 2019, and, you know, how many people, including yourselves, thought, oh, God, you know, it's gonna, the market's going to be horrible uh, in 2019. And this just goes to show nobody ever knows. Nobody ever knows. It's why we don't get in the prediction game of what's going to happen over the next year. S&P 500 posts best first half in 22 years. U.S. economy grew at a 3.1% rate in first quarter, pretty strong. S&P, it's record here again, we're working backwards. Job openings outnumber the unemployed by widest gap ever. I don't know about you, but I'm having a difficult time finding people to fix stuff, my house and at my ranch, and, and you know, I'm trying to get a few things done, and they're telling me it's gonna be three months, and you know, if at all. So um, a big question is, is the employment situation going to slow growth? Because if I can't get all this stuff done, that means I can't pay people to get the stuff done, which means that there's less economic activity. Eurozone economy slows as demand for exports stall. So there's, uh, there's Europe. Japan surprises with 2.1% growth, but it's not all roses. US consumer sentiment hits highest level in 15 years. U.S.-China trade talks end without a deal. U.S. Product, worker productivity advances at best rates since 2010. Lots of good news in the U.S. economy. Home price growth slows to lowest level since 2012. Uh-oh. Home price growth slows to lowest level since 2012. Are home prices a leading indicator? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. So that would be a question. Does a slowing of growth in a huge, huge, uh, big, massive ticket item like Home prices signal problems ahead. And there are a lot of experts, including the Federal Reserve itself, that, that is making some cautionary sounds. 
U.S. stocks rally to put S&P 500 at new records. So you see a whole series of, right, a whole series of, uh, I'm going to put a check mark, whole series of, um, of records for the S&P 500. Global stock rally defies dimming economic outlook. So we can see that the performance of stocks can be very different from concerns or performance of the economy. U.S. budget deficit grew 15% in the first half of fiscal 2019. One of our concerns, and one of, I think, many people's concerns, is what happens to all the debt that is growing in this country? How will it be paid off? IMF cuts 2019 global growth outlook. So those are some headlines there. I like to review them just to ground everybody in uh, what's going on. We'll skip these. We've already been through a lot of headlines. So here are the uh, performance of different asset classes. And we can see S&P 500, Russell 1000, Russell 3000, Russell 1000. These are all U.S. Uh, stock indexes. And they are all at the top, 4.3, 4.25, 4. And then right here, we get the MSCI world, X United States. Whenever you see X, that means excluding. MSCI world excluding the United States comes in fifth. Not bad, 3.79, and that was reflected earlier as I showed you in developed market stocks, uh, global REITs. Here's the Russell 2000, which is small companies, um, U.S. small cap, value. You can see that value shows up here. We're going to talk about value too. Value is outperforming. All these are value indices, and they are underperforming the general broad markets. Todd will have more to say about that. U.S. REITs, not such a great quarter for them. And here is emerging markets right here at the bottom, right along with cash. So this slide is echoing what I showed you before in terms of performance of emerging markets versus the other um, versus the other global indices. So here we are looking at U.S. stocks. And we can see growth. Large growth is the strongest performer of all the sectors of U.S. stocks. And here we have large values, small values, small companies, sm small companies and value companies at the bottom. This is a trend that has been going on for, uh, you know, for a while. So if we take a look at the one-year returns, here's the one-year return for large growth, and here's the one-year return for large value. 3% difference uh, between those. Look at the difference over the three-year period, 18% and 10% growth versus value. Look at the five-year period, 13% and 7%. Look at the 10-year period, a little bit closer, 16 and 13. So another question that, that is being begged, why are we investing in large, should we be investing in value stocks? Why are we investing in value stocks? And even, even lower for small value. And of course, one of the pre presentations I give to clients using the Matrix book, you may remember when you first signed on with New Capital, and I gave a presentation to you showing the historical outperformance of value stocks by 2% a year and the historical outperformance of small cap stocks by about 2% a year. So have those premiums become penalties? So we're gonna talk about that. And in the US accounts for 55% of the global market capitalization. That's up from about 50%. So the US has had a strong run over this period. Still annotating. Here. Excuse me, I'm having a little mouse problem. Okay, international uh, developed stocks. What's going on in international developed? Same thing. Look, here's growth at the top of the charts, value at the bottom of the charts, right? And again, growth, 4.36, value, minus 1.8 over the, over the uh, one-year period. Now look, over the three years, it's a little tighter, 1% difference. Over the five-year period, 4% and flat. 7.81 and 5.62. So I hope you see these things can move around, right? You can get something close over the three-year period and then something widens out over the 10-year period. So that should be the hint that we're trying to drive at, that these things can turn around very, very quickly. Um, do remember that you do have 
plenty of growth stocks in your portfolio. It's not that we don't hold growth stocks in your portfolio, but we hold value stocks as well. International developed markets, 34% of the global uh, stock market valuations. And emerging market, interestingly in emerging markets, you can see that uh, value over the quarter actually outperformed growth, although not by very much, right? Half a percentage point by down by about 13. Uh, but also, so let me go down to the chart below. So here, growth over the one year period in emerging markets, uh, minus 2.44, look at this change. The value actually is outperformed by 7%. Uh, and then growth over the three-year period versus value, pretty close, right? Growth outperforms a little bit wider over the five-year period and about 2% here. So again, you can see these things can turn around. And in fact, they did turn around over the past one-year period in the emerging markets where value stomped uh, growth stocks by over 7%. Emerging markets account for 12% of the stock market capitalization. All right, countries. How did countries do in the second quarter? Well, here's the US, right? It wasn't the top performing country, right? Look at Switzerland. So you are probably unhappy that we didn't put 100% of your money in Switzerland, right? Or Germany, right? Why didn't New Capital invest 100% of your assets in these? All right, let's let's leave aside the United States in the second quarter, right? We should have put 100% of your money into Singapore, 6.58%, doubled up just about the U.S. performance. How about Greece? Maybe we should have put 100% of your money into Greece, 23.44% return in Greece. Anybody going to Greece this summer for vacation? I know a lot of people have been going to Greece. Greece is very much in again. Think about where Greece was, I don't know, three, four, five years ago in the midst of a massive, massive uh, currency crisis and, and, and really political economy crisis with its participation and membership in the Eurozone and its currency tied to, to really strong currencies, especially you know, the, uh, the Euro um, led by Germany. So why didn't we put 100% of your assets into Russia? You should really be upset with us for not making the call on 16.66% in Russia. So. Look, the point is this, we hold the diversified portfolio for you so that we can give you some exposure to this and to this, right? We can never guess which you know, country is going to be the top performer in, in uh, any particular quarter. So yes, the US had a stronger performance versus, by, by a little bit versus all of these together, but the top performers in the developed markets far and away outperformed the United States. So I, I like to show that chart to remind everybody about those things. How about currencies? Uh, pretty strong performance by these developed market currencies versus the dollar. So these are all performance versus the dollar. Uh, the British pound, not so good. New Zealand dollar versus the dollar, depreciated versus the dollar. But by and large, these uh, right here had an outperformance and pretty strong outperformance versus the US dollar as well in the emerging markets. So just to remind you, your holdings in international stocks uh, and bonds, you get an extra return from currency if it outperforms uh, in foreign markets. And that would have been the case over the last quarter. Real estate investment trusts, uh, I guess the thing to point out here is stronger international outperformance, strongly so, versus the United States at 0.82. So U.S. REITs have been very, very strong over a long period of time. Look at this, 15.4 for 10 years, every single year. And we hold for you U.S. real estate investment trusts in your portfolio, and I have for 10 years and more, uh, versus 9.84. But look at that, incredible! I mean, that's the biggest number of all the numbers we've looked at. So REITs have been a very strong asset class 
but of course, um, and year to date, look at it year to date, 16% year to date, international real estate, 14.68, right? Uh, over the three year period, international has outperformed the 3.73 and uh, US over that period. But this particular quarter, very strong outperformance versus uh, US rates. Commodities, what's going on in the world of commodities? Well, for the quarter, uh, commodities in general were down minus one point, uh, about 1% about down. Year to date, up about five. Look at the 10 year, minus 3.74. Look at the five year, down 9% a year, every single year. So commodities have had a really bad run. Uh, we generally do not hold commodities in our client portfolios. Uh, one of the things that, that we tend to believe is that emerging markets, which tend to be commodity-based economies, often perform, I don't know about in line, but in a very correlated fashion with commodities. So, so and, and in fact, they have, right? Emerging markets have been weak, not this week, uh, but they've been weak. And um, we can see that it was a, a bang-up quarter for corn. I think that must be because of all the rain that destroyed the crops in the Midwest, where all the floods and so on wrecked the harvest or wrecked the planting season, and that drove up the, uh, the cost of corn, same for wheat. I think that's what's going on. Coffee, very interesting, up 10%. One of the reasons uh, why we've seen a lot of immigration from places like Guatemala is because coffee prices have fallen precipitously over the last few years. I think about 75% is what the drop in the value of the coffee commodity market has, or coffee prices have been. And that has driven a lot of coffee producers in Guatemala out of business and caused them to have to immigrate. So we, we don't think about that when we, when we talk about the immigration question, but that's the economic backdrop that's gone on. This is good news for those economies that depend upon stronger coffee prices that we see in the second quarter. But look, the most of the commodities were down. Look at natural gas, down 16.67%. That may happen during the summer when people don't uh, burn much natural gas, uh, uh, which is often used for heating. Um, and then here's the, uh, let's see, where's the crude? Here it is, here's crude, uh, down one and a half percent. So not, not a huge change in that market for oil, which of course has a big, a big impact on our local economy here in Houston. Fixed income uh, and, and uh, interest rates. So the blue, the blue, if you can see the blue line, it's kind of tight together, but here, this blue line right in the middle of, of, of this chart, the blue line right in the middle is where the yield curve was at the end of March. And now this is where the yield curve roughly is at the end of June. And what you can see is that it's, it's moved down, right? The interest rates have moved down, but the shape of it looks almost identical. So the shape of the yield curve has not changed, but the rates of the uh, curve have dropped. And of course, the way you read this is this is the duration of the, of the, of the interest rates, right? So one year all the way out to 30 years. And so what it's saying is that you actually right now are getting paid a higher interest rate on a one-year bond than you are on a five-year bond. So that's an inverted yield curve. Usually we expect the yield curve to go this way, right? The, the, you get a higher interest rate if you hold a longer-term bond. Remember, a bond is a loan. And so if you loan money for longer, generally you get paid a higher interest rate. That's not the case at this little point in the yield curve. So we have an inverted yield curve at that point. But after the five years, the curve picks up again and you begin, to get, you begin to get paid higher interest rates uh, as we go along. So, um, and you can see that the yield curve is noticeably different from one year ago, right? This was one year ago, up at the top, this brown one right here. And at that time, the yield curve flattened out, right? It rose pretty steeply on the short term, and then it flattened out. Well, since then, the, the Federal Reserve has raised short-term interest rates, but, the longer term interest rates, especially in the intermediate term, five and 10, have said, we're not going along with that. That's basically 
what the market is saying. Uh uh. You, you can raise the short term interest rates, but we're not going to raise the medium term interest rates. Okay. Global fixed income, uh, kind of an interesting slide. Take a look at the yield curves in Germany, right? They're upward sloping, so that's kind of normal and what we normally see. But um, look, right here, the interest rates are below zero. We've seen this before, same thing in Japan, not as strongly so, but the interest rates are below zero. So people in those countries are actually paying interest to own those bonds. Can you imagine? Let me pay, let me pay the German government interest for me to put my money into, for me to loan them money. I'm going to loan them money and I'm going to pay them interest. That's really what's going on. Is that, the Yiddish word for that is mashuga, <laughs> which means crazy. So that's what's going on there. That's, that's uh, 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 a really, really expensive bond to hold. Doesn't get much more expensive than that. And then uh, the last slide here I'm gonna show before I turn it over to Todd is the impact of diversification. And uh, what we see is that you got paid in the first quarter, oh, my drawing, you got paid in the first quarter to take risk, right? The more stock you held in your portfolio, the better your performance of your portfolio was, right? This would right here be an all cash portfolio. You would have done 0.6, and if you held all stocks, you did 3.8%, and then all points in between. So most people are you know, somewhere around this area. You should have seen about a two, two to 3% rise in your portfolio over that period. Todd's nodding his head that that's, that's about what we can expect. And, and you can see that, that from a portfolio context, this is about what we see almost all the time. The more stock you hold in the portfolio, the stronger their performance. It holds for the 10-year period. It holds for the five-year period. It holds for the three-year period. And it's holding for the one-year period. Right? And so, uh, uh, and it's holding for the year-to-date period. So you may say, well, why don't I just hold 100% stocks? Well, you can if your time horizon fits it and if your circumstances. But there are times when these things reverse, as we saw in 2008. And so that's one of the reasons why these portfolios in here, 50-50, 60-40, and so on, are, are often the recommended portfolio. Because as we see right here with the dark blue, it can get pretty volatile, right? This is not a volatile portfolio. You can see that this olive colored portfolio, very little uh, peaks and valleys and, and rises and drops versus this portfolio. Lots and lots of peaks and valleys and look at some of these drops right here, right? Blammo, blammo, you know, even, even here, right? So this is what causes people to wanna quit on their portfolios. And that's why we often settle into here with, with uh, people's portfolios, especially those who are retired or retiring and so on. Okay, so that does it for my presentation. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope it was informative. And I'm going to turn it over to Todd now, who's going to talk about, uh, from a valuation standpoint, talk about some of the things that I mentioned and alluded to in my presentation. Okay, Todd, take it away. All right, great. Hopefully everybody can see my screen here. Uh, thanks, Leonard. Um, so as Leonard alluded to, I want to talk a little bit about um, the factors and uh, maybe talk a little bit more intimately about some of the portfolio returns or the, the, the returns that we're experiencing in, in some of the portfolios. Uh, we've been getting... Um, We've got some questions. I mean, when you see the um, the magnitude of the, of the outperformance of the U.S. stocks versus world stocks, and as Leonard has talked to, uh, re just, just recently mentioned uh, that we have a lot of international exposure, and we've been talking about international stocks for some time. Um, you know, there's been some divergence, and um, it's it's important to we want to address that, uh, and then talk about um, why we still think it's a it represents a good uh, opportunity going forward. So the first slide here is just a graph of the DFA U.S. Core Equity 2 Fund versus the S&P 500. 
And so the DFA US Core Equity 2 Fund is, is a fund that majority of our clients hold. It's the core fund. So it has a broad-based uh, exposure to US equities. It has tilts though to the value and the uh, small cap um, style factors as well as uh, profitability uh, is in there uh, additionally. But, but ultimately this has large cap stocks, it has small cap stocks, it has growth stocks, it has value stocks, but it has tilts to the, towards those factors that DFA and through their research has shown uh, to, um, uh, to outperform over long periods of time. And I want to run this versus the S&P 500 because uh, we received some calls from clients um, as they look at their fidelity statements. Oftentimes, uh, their performance of their portfolios are compared to U.S. stocks of the S&P 500. And we've actually had some clients ask, is DFA broken or is it, uh, is it time to give up on DFA? And so this first chart, again, shows the... Um, orange line here is the DFA fund and the blue line is the S&P. And for the most part, uh, going back over the last seven years, they kind of went in tandem and we really didn't see much divergence uh, or significant divergence really until uh, last year. And then last year, we really started to see a separation um, in the DFA US core equity two fund versus the S&P 500. And this is really attributed to the value premium and the small cap premium. Uh, and really been emphasized, um, as you can see in the lines. And then actually, if you want to look at the numbers, you can see over a one-year period here, uh, the underperformance of the core equity two fund versus the S&P 500 is 6.3%. But had you held it the entire seven-year period, you would have underperformed by 1%. So not the outcome we would expect, but uh, over the last seven years, uh, if you only trailed by 1%, that's not that bad. Uh, moving forward, we run a diversified core uh, or diversified world exposure for your um, for your equity exposure in the, in the models. And so we use the DFA World Core Equity Fund to DREIX uh, as a ticker symbol as a proxy for your portfolios. Uh, the way we construct your portfolio is actually allocating, we're allocating to the Core Equity 2 Fund, the Core International Fund, the Core Emerging Markets Fund. Uh, and so some people may have this, the DREIX uh, in smaller accounts, but ultimately what we're doing is we're mimicking this fund just through three separate funds. But the reason I wanted to show this is here you can see um, that the DFA World Core Equity Fund versus the SP 500 Fund has had a much larger divergence. Uh, and this divergence here is attributed to not only value, not only value and small cap, but also international. And that's been the bigger thing. And so, yeah, the small cap and value premiums, as Leonard showed in some of the slides previously, um, has underperformed even internationally. The real, real drag in performance. And again, short term, 8.7% uh, in last year has been really this international effect. And this next slide really accentuates that. So now I'm looking at the MSCI All Country World Index XUS versus the S&P 500. So these are stocks, this is every stock in the world minus the US. And here is the US and you can see the divergence is, is, is quite meaningful here. Again, in last year, 9.1%. So, um, you know, the it, international stocks have underperformed, you know, for uh, the better part of 10 years, really the last seven years, we're looking at 7.6% underperformance, 6.4 versus 14%. 14%. So it has been uh, a very tough run for international stocks, there's no question about it. But I think even more, um, it's been even more painful really in more recent memory, more recent period, as we see in really, you know, US stocks really uh, start to diverge even more. Uh, and that's been accentuating uh, maybe a little bit more anxiety of why are we in international stocks? Why are we buying these things? So the first thing I wanted to look at is before we get international is look at value. And so this is a chart that I run uh, and update monthly. And what this does, is it compares the Russell 1000 values index versus the Russell 1000 growth index. And we create a, we basically create a an index that compares the two performances or each month. And if value outperforms, the line goes up and it's above the line here. And if growth outperforms, it's below this blue line. And so you can see going back to 1989, um, that the growth actually had a relatively strong run, but a particularly strong run here during the tech bubble. And for those of you who remember that were investing at the, during that time frame, um, you know, that was a, a, a euphoric time uh, in, in equity markets. Equities were reaching new highs consistently. Uh, and uh, stocks were uh, at uh, very extreme valuations during that period of time. 
But it's interesting because a lot of the newspapers, especially right around here, a lot of the headlines were that value investing is broken. And why was value investing broken? It was broken because the internet was the new economy. The internet was changing everything. And the traditional way that we look at stocks and looking at price to book ratios and things like, like that didn't matter. It was, price to, it was price to sales ratios were the things that mattered. And uh, the market started to get um, a little uh, overconfident about the future prospects of growth and the future prospects of equity returns. Additionally, around this time, a lot of talk was made about a legendary investor named Warren Buffett, which we all know and we all have a lot of exposure to. And at that point, it was Warren Buffett is old Warren Buffett is washed up Warren Buffett has no uh, has his 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 method of looking at stocks is dead and um, and so a lot of the a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the talk at that time uh, was right around here as the market was reaching peaks and evaluations were being extended and what do we see once the tech bubble burst value stocks ripped and they did extraordinarily well and value stocks outperformed growth by a wide margin and that was true all the way up until the top of the um, financial crisis, the top of the market in 2007. And then we know what happened in 08. And as 08, as the, uh, the financial crisis hit, we started to see growth make a comeback here. So over the last 10 years, growth has outperformed value as we've, as we've seen. But more importantly, as I alluded to earlier, in this last, last uh, couple of years here, it's really been emphasized. We've really seen a, a, a divergence of growth and value. Looks a lot like this here, doesn't it? And actually, if you look at what the rhetoric is right now, just talk about Warren Buffett being too old, Warren Buffett not working, is that, that he's, he's behind the times. There's talk about uh, the new economy, the Fed. This is a whole different world now. Value investing is broken. Value investing doesn't work. So you're starting to hear a lot of similarities that we heard when the market reached the peak uh, in the tech boom. Uh, and we're starting to hear that again now. Uh, interestingly also is that these lines, although I've drawn a lot on here, it's hard to see, these black lines represent what's called the, the two standard deviations uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the gray line. And typically in statistics, when a, um, when a measure hits two standard deviations, it's usually at an extreme level and it usually means reverts back. And so those are usually very key uh, points that uh, statisticians and market decisions look at when they look at um, uh, a price uh, study. And uh, we're getting close. We've already hit two standard deviations back here in, in 2018. We're back again now. And so as we hang around two standard deviations, this looks attractive to us. This looks like an opportunity. Uh, and we expect that, look, value at some point is going to come back and value is going to come back. And when it comes back, it could come back very, very meaningfully. You can also see that the two standard deviation study worked on the upside as well. Look what happened when value outperformed growth and that got to reach two standard deviations expensive, as you would say, value continued at that point actually started to underperform. And so I think this actually gives us hope and gives us um, a little optimism going forward for our portfolios and our exposure to value and our, and, and our, and our, in, in your portfolios and uh, our conviction uh, with that, with these risk premiums. On the other side is small cap premiums we talked about. So we know that the, um, the DFA funds have the value factor, but they also have small cap and small cap, uh, can be looked at in the same way. So this is a study with Russell 2000, which is a small cap index, versus the Russell 1000, which is a large cap index. And much like we saw in the other study here in the late, uh, in the 90s, you saw a, a divergence where large cap stocks outperform small cap. Uh, we hit the top of the tech bubble, and then we saw small caps rally. And then from really from 2006 on, it's been a mixed bag. But until recently, we're starting to see now that small cap stocks are actually one standard deviation um, cheap to, uh, to large cap stocks at this point here. So again, um, hasn't been as impactful uh, and as a drag, I would say, on overall performance, but nonetheless, it has been, uh, and we're starting to reach some extreme levels, although not as extreme as, as value. And again, that, I think that points to our optimism uh, of these premiums going forward. All right, so looking at international stocks um, and from a valuation perspective, and as Leonard and I have continually, I think we're probably sounding like a broken record at this point, we talk a lot about valuations and we talk a lot about um, the, uh, the, 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 the benefits of not um, you know, of buying cheaper stocks or, or, or buying value. And so this, this table here just shows the S&P 500, the all country world index, again, minus the US, uh, looking at 
current valuation, so the price to earnings ratio. So how much are we paying for the earnings of the companies uh, in a particular market? And so right now, currently the S&P 500 is trading at 16.4 times its earnings. Its 20 year average is about 15.8 times its earnings. So you can see the S&P is more expensive than its 20 year average, although it's not extreme, extremely expensive. And for point of reference in 1999, the S&P was about almost 30, 30, 30 times, 32 times, uh, I'm saying, right there. But we are expensive um, by historical measures. But looking at international stocks, international stocks are trading 13 times with a 20 year average is 14.1. So international stocks are actually cheaper today than their 20 year historical average. And typically, when we buy international stocks, we usually get about, we pay about 89% of the premium for U.S. in the perspective that way. So you can see here that we're actually picking up about a 10% discount or 10% cheap to the, uh, to the, to the, mark, to the U.S. markets uh, or the international markets. And then from dividend perspective, here you can see that U.S. dividends are roughly at 2.1%, uh, very close to the 20-year average. We're looking at international stocks. International stocks, we're getting a 3.5% yield versus a 20-year average of 3%. So picking up 50 basis points in yield. Traditionally, international stocks give you about 150% of the yield of the U.S. Right now, 168%, right? So a 28, almost a, what is that, a 18%, um, almost 20% discount on a dividend basis are international stocks versus U.S. stocks. So if we go back and we talk about from a value perspective in small cap, we think things are in our favor. We think the wind is in our backs. And that, from that standpoint, if we look at international stocks here, you can see that valuations also are in our favor and think that those are winds that will be at our back as well. Um, so moving forward to, to emerging markets, and we talk a lot about emerging markets. And um, unfortunately, this wasn't, was, wasn't a stellar quarter for emerging markets, as Leonard had, had, had alluded to. And uh, you know, emerging markets have a lot, of, um, there's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of uncertainty in emerging markets. But the big story is really um, depicted here in this slide. Uh, and I think this is a really important slide, and this is something that's going to be that I would assume we will point to a lot going forward. And this shows the growth of the middle class and the growth that's happening in the emerging world and looks at the five biggest kind of emerging economies, if you will. And what it's showing is that every emerging economy is getting a large, a growing middle class. That's tremendous growth opportunity for, for stocks. And if you think about it, a growing middle class means an increase in wealth. And as people become more wealthy, they want to buy things, they want to consume, they want to travel. And so they're going to uh, become the big, the world consumers. They're gonna become the big consumers of the world's products. And if you just take a look at something like India, that 1995, only 1% of their population, now this is a billion people we're talking about, 1% was, was considered middle class. By 2018, it was 14%. By 2030, that's only 12 years away or 11 years away, 80% of the emerging markets, of, uh, I'm sorry, of India are gonna be considered middle class. China, they didn't have anybody classified as middle class in 1995. And then in that time frame, in the last, uh, what is that, 20, 25 years or so, 34% uh, are in the middle class on the way to 72. Brazil, again, the same thing, up to 61. Mexico, up to 80. All of these economies, these arrows are growing in this direction. This represents a huge opportunity going forward. All right, this is what a lot of investors, and it's why you hear a lot of people say emerging markets are gonna be the place to be going forward. At some point, uh, these economies are going to take over and demand is going to be uh, so strong that companies that, that can service these local economies are going to be tremendous investments. And then the last slide here looks at realized returns and expected returns and, and why uh, we continue to be consistent in our outlook to diversification uh, and to these international stocks. And I think this, this slide really speaks to that. First thing I want to show you, draw your attention to is U.S. stocks. So this is looking at returns, the blue line. So this is the last 10 years, since 2009, U.S. stocks have annualized at, call it about 15%. At the same time frame, emerging markets have annualized at about 
and IFA, which is developed um, international stocks, called about 11%. But look what's going to happen, the expectation is going forward over the next 10 to 15 years. U.S. stocks are projected to return about 5%. Emerging markets, close to 9. International stocks, 7.5 or 8. Right? This is the thing, is that a lot of the returns that we've experienced in the, um, uh, in the markets over the last 10 years are largely going to be revert, and we're going to see a new leader, and that's the expectation. This is a slide, actually, that's done by J.P. Morgan, and every year they come out with their 10 year uh, capital market assumptions. And actually I did a study, they've been doing this for a long time. And actually I did a study um, uh, several years back to look at their um, hit rate, if you will, uh, because we don't know what the next 10 years are gonna be. Uh, but you'd be surprised that they were very, very close in most of these categories of getting uh, pretty, pretty darn close to what the actual realized 10 year return was. In some cases it was within, you know, one or 2%. And so uh, they've been, uh, the hit rate has actually been relatively good. And so uh, although we're not guaranteeing this is what will happen, we do draw some confidence that, um, that, uh, that this is the direction that, uh, that things will go. And that being said, we don't want to, you don't want to transition your portfolios uh, and move your portfolios and chase the returns that we've already seen in the U.S. because largely in the future, they're not going to be there. The returns are going to be elsewhere. And we think they'll be up there in the uh, in, in international um, international markets. So with that, I will turn it over to Catherine and uh, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Okay, sorry, the question that came in is, are there plans for significant investment rotations with a goal to pursue the international and emerging market growth that is predicted? That's, That's a great, great question. You know, the, the question basically is, well, okay, is, is, isn't there an argument for uh, overweighting the international investments? Because we're market weight. Uh, we're, we're weighting them according to market. Uh, and I would say there are, there are no current plans because the valuations international versus U.S. are not what we would consider to be extreme. Uh, if we saw a divergence like, if we saw a divergence as similar to what occurred in 1999 and 2000, where U.S. stocks were trading at 32 er times earnings, and we just simply could not justify that in any way, shape, or form, uh, you know, that sort of valuation to us, again, we wouldn't know what the environment is right now. I guess there could be an environment where, where, where that would be justified. But it's it's hard it's hard to foresee that that would be you know what we would consider to be obscene valuations. I don't know what other word to use. Um, and and I went through that. Uh, Todd, you've been through that, and 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 so we know what that looks like, and we know what it looks like when buy this stock now is appearing you know on the cover of not just uh, I don't know Money Magazine, but on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, then, then, and, and accompanying that would be an enormous discount with international valuations. Uh, then I think we would have to think uh, very, very seriously about about overweighting international. And and I think there are firms now that that are doing some overweighting versus international. Um, it's not really our style to diverge from. Uh, from market weights, it takes it's it would take a as I say a serious serious overvaluation and discrepancy uh, in that in that way that I just described. So no, there's no thought of it right now. Um, we 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 would um, and 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 by the way, it's not like we're it's not that we're hoping that we see outperformance versus international because. Your portfolios have a market weight to U.S. stocks, and if we see a, a broad outperformance of international versus U.S., you know your U.S. stocks, relatively speaking, are going to underperform versus international. So this is why we believe in diversified portfolios. We're not we're not picking and choosing so much. We do have an overweight toward value, and 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 I think we would like to see some outperformance of value because of that tilt and some outperformance of small cap, and we think that at some point that's gonna happen. We can't tell you when. There was a big piece that I get in, in the, uh, my email inbox
from a, a blog that I like, and they surveyed an incredible number of professionals. And the question was, is the value, is value investing a dead? And the majority of the responses by far was no, absolutely not. Uh, we don't know when it's going to happen, but it's, it's going to turn around. The laws of investments are, are, have not been repealed. And very often when we're in some period uh, of outperformance by one particular sector, everyone starts talking about, you know, well, the laws of investing have been repealed. And more often than not, we find out that's, that's not the case. Um, okay, any other, any other, so, 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 so that's it. We've got a number of suggestions. Um, uh, Kelly has suggested that I talk about a day in my life. I can tell you today I went to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I got a clean bill of health, <laughs> no cavities. Uh, and um, then we did webinar prep. We had uh, hamburgers from Shake Shack for lunch and, and uh, some fries. And uh, let's see, I'm going to go to pick up some uh, medicine to deal with the sciatica that's crept up in my, <laughs> in my left hip. And then I'm going to go home. Uh, so that's uh, really exciting, right? Day in, the, day in my life. Uh, and then some of you have, have suggested, two people have suggested, thoughts on global warming as a uh, future webinar. I think that's a great idea. I think that a lot of people are concerned about this, and it would be, make a really great topic. So I think we'll, I think we'll do that uh, sooner rather than later and, and, and focus in on that. Um, and um, it is a concern, and companies to companies themselves are having to think about what risks do they disclose in their portfolios. I'm sorry, in their, what, what risks do they disclose in their annual reports and in their other filings? And there's quite a bit of agitation to, to change what uh, is disclosed to make sure that, say, an oil company has to disclose what would happen to their business if we had substantial uh, problems and risks that materialize in global warming. So I think it's a great idea. A couple of people suggested it, so we'll, we'll, uh, Strongly consider that. Probably we'll do it. There's Catherine. Okay, one more question came in, or another question came in. Okay, next question is Are you investigating other managers with a higher, longer range performance than DFA? Well, for those of you who, who have been paying attention to our uh, recent pronouncements, we have now added a whole set of portfolios called Passive Pure Portfolios. We've had a webinar on it, we've talked about it in our newsletters, and what we've said is, if you are bothered by tracking error that has resulted in underperformance of the value tilted, um, small cap tilted portfolios, our Passive Pure Portfolios are basically pure index performance. So are we considering, not only are we considering, we've done it, we have it, it it's here. <laughs> and if you want it, and, and uh, all we gotta do is talk about it. We talked about the fact that at this point after a 10 year bull market in, in non-qualified accounts, meaning accounts that are taxed, uh, may be a real problem to pay a big, a big tax to get out of the passive uh, plus portfolios and into the passive uh, pure portfolios, but in in IRAs and other non -quali and other qualified accounts, uh, we can trade you out without any kind of tax penalty whatsoever. Um, to date, uh, I don't know that anybody has taken us up on that, and people are people are content to stay where they are. But um, we we don't want to force anybody into any. Uh, tilt if they don't want to tilt. We think the tilts are going to are going to pay off over time, as they have over you know almost a hundred years of investing. So those portfolios exist. New Capital provides them. If you want to, again, we we invite you if you're interested in the passive pure portfolios, which are just sort of a straight index, uh, straight index fund, S and P 500 type fund or MSCI World type fund. We have those portfolios crafted. Um, and they are ready to go if that's of interest. So yes, not only would we consider it, they're here. Hope that answers that question. And if you have any more questions about uh, that, by all means, don't hesitate to, to ask us. Anything else? 
Okay, so that's that, that's it. I want to thank everybody. We're going to turn it turn it back to you for closing, or, sure. or uh, Catherine's going to close it up. Thank you very much for all of you for taking your time today. I hope you're having a great summer. And uh, if you have any need whatsoever, of course, please let us know. We love working for you and serving you, and um, we especially love it when you uh, come to our webinars and and let us take additional time with you to explain what we do and why we're doing it. We're really gratified to when you when you are among our attendees. Okay, back to Catherine to uh, wrap it up finally. Let's see. Okay, guys, thanks again for being here. Um, I, just as a quick note, we will be including a copy of uh, a recording of today's webinar um, on, uh, in the newsletter and on uh, the New Capital website uh, for you all already saw it. But if there's anyone else who uh, wants to see it or you want to share this content with anyone, that will work. And that is it. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate you being here and I uh, hope to see you on the next webinar. Everyone have a great day. Thanks.